Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending from where you are joining us. Welcome to the second edition of the Aswan Forum and to this session on a comprehensive approach to protection of civilians' mandates in peacekeeping operations. Of course, we wish that this meeting could have taken place in Aswan in person. However, due to obvious reasons, we are looking forward that the next edition will be in Aswan. Excellencies, it is a distinct pleasure and honor to chair this session of the Aswan Forum titled A Comprehensive Approach to Protection of Civilian Mandates in Peacekeeping Operations. I will begin with a brief overview of the subject of our discussion today. From the 2015 High-Level Independent Panel on Peacekeeping Operations, the HEPCO report, to the 2020 report of the Special Committee on Peacekeeping Operations, the C-34, peacekeeping normative frameworks and policy documents reference the importance of people-centered approaches as a core element in ensuring more effective performance of peace operations. The integration of the protection of civilians mandate in armed conflict into the Security Council agenda and its development through the adoption of many thematic resolutions addressing POC-related issues demonstrates that the United Nations commitment toward making peace for the welfare of people. Today, six peacekeeping operations are mandated with the protection of civilians. One, on the ground, peacekeeping operations take an integrated whole of mission approach to the implementation of these mandates. Through the work of civilian, police and military personnel and supported by peacekeeping guideline guiding principles. These efforts include numerous areas of engagement from political advocacy, dialogue and mediation to building capacity of state protection actors to the provision of physical protection. And with the COVID-19 measures put in place restrict movement and limit direct contact between peacekeepers and communities, the robust approach of protecting civilians has been put to the test. This has further highlighted the importance of empowering people and fostering community resilience as a central objective of peacekeeping operation. This session will touch upon the importance of recalibrating the protection of civilian related tasks of peacekeeping operations towards empowering local communities, including women, youth, refugees, and IDPs, by providing them with the necessary tools to mitigate threats and build resilience within the contours of broader national efforts and political processes. This should be mainstreamed in the long-term vision of their contributions to building and sustaining peace and in preparation of their drawdown and exit. To reflect on that matter, I am delighted to be joined today by highly distinguished panelists, Their Excellencies, Mr. Jean-Pierre Lacroix, Under Secretary General for Peace Operations, Mr. Manukir Nidaya, Special Representative of the Secretary General for the Central African Republic and Head of MINUSCA, Ms. Liberta Mulamula, Member of the UN Secretary General's Peace Building Fund, Sixth Advisory Board. And before handing over to our distinguished panelists, I was requested to reflect on the following question. How can the PPC, as a cross-pillar coordination body, support and draw upon peacekeeping efforts in protecting civilians to help lay the foundation for long-term 
and sustainable peace. And indeed, it is my great honor that for this session of PBC, Egypt and myself is honored to be the chair of the PBC. And to dwell into the answers of this question, I will highlight the following point. The contribution of peacekeeping operations to peace building and sustaining peace cannot be overstated. This important link was highlighted in the Security Council Presidential Statement 27-2017 and was well captured as one of the pillars of the Action for Peace initiative of the Secretary General. Protection of civilians has been one of the peacekeeping operations priority mandates. States always have the primary responsibility to protect their populations. Peacekeepers' first role is to support governments to uphold their protection responsibilities through advice, technical and logistical support and capacity building. Peacekeeping missions also seek through political good offices and mediation to take a preventive approach to protecting civilians. This, of, this of course, in addition to providing physical protection when required. Therefore, the PPC is well positioned through its convening, bridging, and advisory roles to first convene relevant stakeholders and partners with a view to mobilize international support and attention to efforts aiming at building state capacities and institutions in the area of protecting civilians, of protection of civilians. Second, advise the Security Council upon review of peacekeeping mandates on areas where the Council can draw upon to strengthen the peace building component of the mandate, building on the nationally identified and the context specific peace building priorities of the country's concern. Third, support a whole of mission integrated and people centered approach to protection of civilians. It is critical that attention be given to building capacities at the local levels, including in the remote and border areas, with a view to build state and community resilience. Fourth, build partnerships with regional, sub regional organizations and international financial institutions to complement efforts of peacekeeping operations in building capacities related to protection of civilians. And now, without further ado, we are going to listen to our distinguished panelists. And uh, it is my great honor to uh, highlight that we are going to actually to give each panelist to reflect on the question in the uh, framework of uh, eight minutes. And then after that, we'll be having also uh, further uh, reflections at the end from the distinguished panelists. And the first panelist is my dear friend, USG Jean-Pierre Lacroix. So Jean-Pierre, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Thank you, dear Mohamed. And it's good to be with you. Uh, albeit uh, virtually. Uh, many thanks for having um, invited me and, and greeting to the other members of the panelists as well as uh, to, the, to the audience. Um, first of all, um, I think it's important to highlight that uh, uh, our peacekeeping mission via their protection of civilian mandate uh, actually protect on a day-to-day -day basis hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people, <laughs> And indeed, for many of them, the presence of a peacekeeping mission really makes a difference between life and death. Absent peacekeepers, uh, there cannot be um, basic services provided to them. There cannot be safety. There cannot be security. And frankly, uh, in, in many cases, uh, those population that are protected uh, have no other choice but to uh, leave and be exposed to all the dangers of, uh, of, uh, of usually uh, very uh, challenging and difficult environment. But I think it's important to highlight that uh, uh, this uh, critical 
uh, difference that our peacekeeping mission are making on protection of civilian and I've <clears throat> seen that very often when visiting the field and uh, and recently have I have seen that in uh, in Mali and uh, also in the DR Congo these were the two countries that I last visited and I went to places uh, uh, quite remote in, in Ituri, uh, uh, North Kivu in the DRC and uh, in the Timbuktu uh, region and Gao region as well. And, uh, and I've seen places uh, where our uh, peacekeepers are deployed, military, civilian and, and, and also police. And I met with the population um, and, and they're all telling us, uh, you know, how grateful they are to, to have a peacekeeping operation uh, you know, present and, and enabling them to uh, to to be protected and to to receive uh, support and, and and humanitarian assistance. So, um, what that implies is that protection of civilian has become uh, one of the key priorities of uh, uh, many peacekeeping mission. Indeed, those uh, big multi-dimensional missions such as MINUSCA and. Uh, uh, very happy to be uh, joining this panel with uh, SRG Moncardi. Um, uh, in those large uh, peacekeeping missions, the protection of civilian mandate is actually one of the top priority. I would say that uh, together with the support to political efforts um, and uh, our role in capacity building, uh, supporting the, the building of state capacity, the, the, the protection of civilian mandate is one of uh, uh, the top priorities. It is also um, a key benchmark by which our peacekeeping missions are judged um, because it's um, quite um, easy to, to understand. Uh, it has an immediate impact, um, you know, when peacekeepers manage to, uh, to secure protection for population. At the same time, uh, it is also a challenging mandate because uh, it raises uh, expectation uh, amongst the population that are in danger and among the uh, constituency of peacekeeping, uh, those uh, who see us and, and, and rate us and observe us, it raises expectation. Protection of civilian mandates raise expectations that are always very, very hard, if not impossible, to uh, uh, to, to achieve. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we, we should just uh, um, um, leave with this uh, uh, gap between expectation achievement. Uh, it just means that we always need to do more and, and to step up our efforts to be more effective on protection of civilian. And, and I believe this is what is happening. First of all, I think there is a, a greater understanding that the protection of civilian is complex and comprehensive and holistic. It's not about only sending uniformed personnel, you know, military when uh, a group uh, uh, of people is threatened. Um, it's about prevention, it's about responding to threats, it's about uh, supporting the building of uh, durable peace. And it's about involving many partners. It's about involving our uh, uniformed personnel, our police, our military, but also our civilian colleagues and our partners from um, humanitarian agencies and NGOs uh, uh, in general, the, the whole UN system and, and beyond partners such as the World Bank and regional sub-regional organization. So this is, uh, I think, a key point uh, which is important to highlight uh, the comprehensive nature, the, the global holistic nature of, of, of peacekeeping. So that's number one. Number two, uh, when I was saying that uh, protection of civilian mandates have evolved and the way in which we implement uh, this mandate has evolved, uh, I'm thinking of the uh, many uh, innovative uh, mechanism uh, that have been put in place by our mission, um, early warning mechanism, uh, community liaison assistance, uh, community alert networks, uh, uh, based on, on the um, building a close uh, relationship and a close interaction with uh, those uh, communities and therefore enabling us to prevent or to help prevent uh, conflict and, and therefore uh, um, reducing uh, the, the, the suffering of the population, but also enabling us to mitigate and resolve conflicts when uh, they occur and, uh, and therefore uh, avoiding uh, violence um, against civilians. 
Um, it is also important to, to highlight the fact that uh, there are many uh, elements uh, in protection of uh, civilian toolkit uh, that are relevant. Um, you know, when I when I go to the field and I'm, when I talk to the population, what I see is that uh, uh, when um, uh, we are deployed uh, um, in an area where a, a population a group of people uh, threaten, um, first of all, the the impact is to create a, a safe area, a relatively safe area, uh, improve uh, the degree of safety and security. Um, Getting to know the community better, getting to understand the community better, building trust, um, and, and here uh, it's a combined role of our civilian, our peacekeepers, our police, our military, men and women, and we all know women play a, a very important role, women peacekeeper, in building uh, or, or helping in uh, the building of trust with communities, and therefore uh, once we, we've built that uh, uh, confident relationship with the communities once uh, we have created uh, this uh, uh, more secure area then we can support uh, the return of the national state we can support the uh, provision of basic services uh, um, health and, and, and food but also uh, support the delivery of uh, uh, um, development related project uh, uh, which are helping community uh, return to their normal life um, and, and usually we, uh, you know, when we talk to, to the population, we, we hear requests to that effect, you know, support the, uh, recons uh, the rebuilding of a bridge or, or, or building wells or, or reopen the school and, and support the, the uh, uh, not only the reopening, but the, the you know, resum resumption of uh, education activities. Those kind of things that are absolutely essential to uh, help people return to their normal life. Um, in addition to that, uh, the, uh, the fact of uh, uh, being there, interacting with communities, help us uh, know better what the environment is and, and potentially help, as I said, uh, detect threats you know, before they actually materialize on the population. So I mentioned the kind of uh, uh, complex and, and, and multifaceted uh, activities uh, uh, that we're carrying out and our missions are carrying out uh, uh, as they are delivering on their protection of civilian mandate. Uh, it's innovative. Uh, uh, I would just name the, uh, uh, the, the one example, the, the community violence reduction program that uh, are um, implemented, uh, for instance, in, in, in Mali, uh, the, the DDR uh, uh, program uh, uh, that are basically uh, supported and, and, and uh, uh, implemented whenever they are, and those uh, uh, two um, those two uh, um, activities are, are complementary to one another. Uh, we support national DDR program, and at the same time, we we, uh, we do support uh, a local community <laughs> violence reduction program, uh, which are based on on community and and really uh, try uh, to address sources of instability at the at, at the local level. Now, um, what uh, about COVID nineteen? Um, well, I, I think. Uh, COVID-19 has obviously been a challenge. It continues to be a challenge to our peacekeeping mission. Uh, but at the same time, um, in spite of all the obstacles and, 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 and the difficulties in dealing with COVID-19, um, our peacekeeping missions have continued to, to, to function. They have put in place a number of uh, protective and preventative measures uh, on, on social distancing, uh, reorganizing the way we do things, uh, rotations, and so on and so forth. And by the way, this uh, would have, wouldn't have been possible without the support of uh, our troop and police contributing countries. And, uh, and, and through you, uh, uh, Ambassador Mohamed, uh, uh, representing one of the uh, uh, most important and dedicated uh, troop and police contributing country, I want to recognize and, and appreciate the support that we, we continue to have, we had and we continue to have from our TCCs and PCCs. But the fact is that uh, uh, we have been able to continue uh, <clears throat> delivering on our mandate. And um, obviously we've had to uh, adjust uh, the the way in which we do things, but having built networks with the communities, 
having engaged for many months and in many cases, many years for the community has really helped uh, preserve that kind of uh, relation. We have a community and, and mechanism that are uh, in place. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, we've also been uh, using uh, new ways, uh, increasingly social media, uh, to uh, alert um, and monitor protection threats and, and, and alert uh, communities uh, on the, um, uh, you know, potential threats, uh, hate speech, uh, uh, rumors, misinformation. Um, we we have uh, um, in Mali, for example, we we have uh, um, generated generated a mapping of uh, hotspots where civilians uh, are at risk. <coughs> Uh, we, we've put in place uh, uh, hotlines to report protection of civilian threats. Uh, so these kind of, uh, of initiatives that have uh, complemented, uh, uh, you know, uh, other, uh, other mechanism and, and other type of activities and which I believe have helped us uh, to continue our, our POC uh, mandate. Um, one thing that we have all also done and which I think uh, was, was critical um, was to uh, reorient, you know, as the, the pandemic began to spread, uh, many of our mission, including MINUSCA, by the way, uh, in the Central African Republic, have reoriented their uh, available funding, uh, programmatic funding, quick impact project towards helping community face uh, deal with the pandemic. Uh, and this has really helped not only uh, national you know, host countries and communities deal uh, uh, with the threat of the pandemic, but uh, this has also played an important role in, in boosting community, the, the level of trust from uh, the communities and therefore their uh, cooperation. Uh, and, and today our mission continue to be very active in, in supporting uh, national and local efforts to cope with the pandemic and, and they will continue to, to do that uh, moving forward. So, um, Ambassador uh, Diem Mohamed, this is what I wanted to say uh, in a few words. Um, and uh, you know, I look forward to hearing the other panelists and of course, to, to further discussion. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, USG Lacroix, and thank you for addressing this important question and highlighting the important points about the considerable progress that has been made over the past 20 years to strengthen the norms and policies governing POC and peacekeeping missions. And really, as you showed that this period has demonstrated that effective implementation of the POC mandate requires a comprehensive, integrated, well-planned, people-centered approach. Nonetheless, of course, the COVID pandemic has amplified, has amplified the vulnerabilities of civilians in complex hotspots and raised new protection challenges for UN personnel. And thank you for reminding us and highlighting the points that the ever uh, for the uh, ever evolving context uh, to which peace operations are deployed and how has the uh, POC mandate evolved over the years uh, in peacekeeping mission settings and how in today's world with the COVID-19 how the uh, new protection needs uh, that has been raised, how the peacekeeping operations managed to implement their POC mandates while reducing their close contacts with communities to mitigate the risk of spreading the virus, and how also uh, what are the tools that uh, have been used to ensure inclusive and sustained community engagement and empowerment. Thank you for really. Uh, your insightful remarks and the many important points really have been raised, including on how missions adapted to the emerging challenges related to the COVID-19 pandemic in delivering against POC mandates. I now turn to SRSG and Kirne Daya and uh, the uh, SRSG and the head of MINUSCA. And uh, we maybe move to a further question in this field. And uh, as Jean Daya, in your latest briefing in the Security Council, you, st you stated that the situation of violence caused in the Central African Republic by armed groups is testing the mission's capacity to carry out its key mandate for the protection of civilians in a tense political and electoral context exacerbated by 
identity-based divisions. In light of the COVID-19 pandemic and the rise in violence, what measures is MONUSCA taking to ensure effective, timely, and integrated delivery of the POC mandate within its provinces of current deployment? How is the mission balancing the three tiers of POC activities in accordance with the operational environment, the new pandemic-related protection needs, the election-related violence? More specifically, how can the mission strengthen local community engagement and empowerment in light of its mandate? So, SRCG, Nidaya, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup, M. le Président et chers frères Mohamed. Euh, merci beaucoup aussi à tous les collègues qui participent à ce panel de haut niveau. Et je vous remercie pour l'opportunité euh, que vous me donnez euh, pour dire un mot sur euh, l'exécution de notre mandat de protection ici à, à, à la MINUSCA. Et je voudrais saluer également toutes les personnalités qui participent à ce panel, dont certaines sont des connaissances personnelles euh, des collaborateurs de, de travail. Et également, que je suis avec beaucoup d'attention d'exposer un petit peu de la de Nations Unies chargée de votre responsabilité, Jean-Pierre Lacroix. Et conformément à son mandat, euh, euh, au rang de ces tâches qui lui sont confiées, euh, la protection des civils reste une priorité absolue de la mission qui est chargée de protéger sans préjudice de la responsabilité première des autorités de la République centrafricaine et des principes fondamentaux euh, du maintien de la paix qui chargent de protéger la population civile euh, qui se trouve sous la menace de violence euh, physique. Euh, la mission a été invitée aussi à prendre des mesures actives en appui aux autorités de la République centrafricaine pour anticiper, euh, pour écarter et pour contrer efficacement toute menace grave ou crédible visant la population civile, euh, selon une approche globale et, et intégrée. Alors pour ce qui est des trois, trois niveaux de protection que euh, je vais exposer très rapidement, l'exécution de notre mandat de protection en zone de conflit répond à l'approche intégrée des trois niveaux euh, de protection des populations civiles, comme le président Mohamed l'a dit tout à l'heure, à savoir la protection à travers le dialogue et les engagements politiques, la protection physique et la protection par la création d'un environnement protecteur. Et la mise en œuvre de ces trois niveaux est simultanée. Euh, ces niveaux s'accommodent mutuellement et se renforcent aussi mutuellement. Il n'y a pas de hiérarchisation inhérente ou de séquençage entre les, les trois niveaux. Euh, D'abord, la protection des civils à travers le dialogue et les engagements politiques. Euh, elle se concrétise par nos initiatives de bons offices auprès des protagonistes du conflit, mais aussi d'autres partenaires internes et externes et les organisations euh, tout régionales. Euh, aussi, nous engageons, nous appuyons et nous accompagnons des accords locaux de paix, véritable outil de protection des populations civiles ou de réduction de la violence d'une manière temporaire ou permanente. Et nous encourageons également les partis à créer des mécanismes de suivi sans lesquels les accords ne seraient pas viables. Certaines sections, telles que notre section des affaires civiles, participent également au travail de cohésion sociale et d'engagement avec les communautés pour le vivre ensemble. Euh, ainsi, notre engagement quotidien auprès du gouvernement, auprès des partis politiques, auprès des groupes armés, euh, a pour objectif de mettre fin au conflit et par ricochet de contribuer au bien-être des différentes communautés. La protection physique. Euh, je le précise, euh, la protection physique ne consiste euh, aucunement à faire la guerre. Euh, compréhension commune de plusieurs acteurs et souvent même des dirigeants. Il est vrai que la protection physique nécessite toutefois le recours à la force, mais pas en toute euh, occasion. L'usage de la force 
euh, doit intervenir en dernier recours. Et les moyens dont dispose la MINUSCA sont plutôt utilisés à titre dissuasif et exceptionnellement en cas, en cas de danger imminent ou pour répondre à une situation qui la nécessite et suivant des règles d'engagement aussi préétablies. Par exemple, l'utilisation de la force pour se défendre et aussi en cas d'attaque pour la population civile. À ce titre, nous avions lancé euh, plusieurs opérations euh, euh, en train dans ce cadre. Je pourrais y revenir euh, si le temps nous le permet. Alors, le troisième niveau, euh, la protection par la création d'un environnement protecteur. Euh, elle revient, euh, ce niveau, elle revient la protection par la création d'un environnement protecteur à créer les conditions propices à l'état de droit et la bonne gouvernance. Cela passe par la restauration de l'autorité de l'État à travers, entre autres, le déploiement des autorités locales, des préfets, des sous-préfets, les maires, euh, les services administratifs, euh, le déploiement de l'appareil judiciaire et de toute la chaîne pénale, le déploiement des forces de sécurité et de, et de défense. Et la MINUSCA a en effet contribué, et beaucoup contribué d'ailleurs, au déploiement des préfets. En Centrafrique, il y a 16 préfectures, mais aujourd'hui, on peut dire que pratiquement les 16 préfets, préfets ou les 15 sont présents à leur poste. Le déploiement également des sous-préfets, parce que l'administration est totalement absente de l'intérieur du pays, 71 sous-préfectures. Aujourd'hui, il y a 67 à 8 sous-préfets qui sont en poste, surtout détendus du territoire national. Et nous continuons également de les soutenir et de les, de les accompagner dans leurs tâches quotidiennes, parfois même à assurer le déplacement sur le terrain parce que généralement ils sont sans moins parfois de déplacement. Parfois vous avez des sous-préfets qui n'ont même pas de véhicule, qui n'ont même pas de moto pour se déplacer, aller à la rencontre des populations et nous les aidons beaucoup pour leur mobilité. Et nous nous assistons d'une manière régulière et soutenue, nous assistons l'administration judiciaire aussi à se déployer et à accomplir ses tâches. Et ce que nous faisons pour les préfets et sous-préfets, parfois nous le faisons aussi pour les procureurs qui doivent aller sur le terrain, parfois sans véhicule, pour se déplacer. Donc, nous assistons l'administration judiciaire à se déployer, à accomplir ses tâches à travers notamment un appui aux enquêtes judiciaires et policières, euh, un appui aux arrestations aussi. Et, et pour ce troisième niveau de protection des populations civiles, il s'agit également pour la MINUSCA de lutter contre l'impunité, de fournir en temps opportun une assistance humanitaire de manière à ne pas euh, exposer la population nécessiteuse tout en s'assurant d'un minimum d'existence de services sociaux de, de base. Et afin d'établir un environnement sûr, la MINUSCA, à travers ses composantes militaires et de police, établit une présence dans toute la RCA, en particulier dans les zones prioritaires où se trouvent les populations à risque, afin de dissuader la violence et de prévenir les violations par les groupes armés du droit à la vie, et de la sécurité des civils. La force de la MINUSCA maintient également une grande mobilité à travers ses bases opérationnelles temporaires, qu'on appelle les QOB, et les forces d'intervention rapide, les QRF, pour réagir rapidement aux menaces passagères, mobiles, et pour étendre également sa présence aux besoins. L'objectif principal est de protéger les populations civiles contre les violences prédatrices communautaires, confessionnelles ou collatérales, parfois, et d'assurer la libre circulation pour les activités euh, communautaires, les activités économiques et humanitaires dans un pays où plus de la moitié de la population a besoin d'une assistance humanitaire. La condition des nombreuses personnes déplacées et des réfugiés n'est donc pas oubliée ni le rôle également dans le processus politique et dans le processus de retour à la paix dans ce pays. Et nous avions beaucoup plaidé pour la participation, par exemple, des réfugiés aux élections. Nous n'avons pas eu gain de cause, finalement, et nous continuons à penser que leur participation aussi rendrait ces élections beaucoup plus inclusives et donnerait également la pleine impression à ces personnes réfugiées que euh, ces des centrafricains à part entière. Alors, l'approche de la protection de la ministre. En, en, en République centrafricaine, la protection des civils passe d'abord par l'anticipation 
et par la prévention. Que nos différentes composantes s'attellent à mettre en œuvre au quotidien, au niveau opérationnel et au niveau stratégique. Par le biais d'une approche robuste et adaptée au contexte centrafricain et avec nos outils et mécanismes d'alerte précoce, les informations reçues et analysées permettent d'anticiper et donc de prévenir la matérialisation des risques. Par exemple, augmenter les patrouilles, parfois des patrouilles de longue portée, des patrouilles robustes, ou décider d'une présence physique temporaire, ça, ça renvoie au deuxième niveau de protection physique, ou alors engager les acteurs pour désamorcer une crise potentielle, ça c'est le premier niveau de la protection et bon processus, ou encore, et si possible, procéder à des arrestations des fauteurs de troubles. Là, là, on est au troisième niveau de protection. Ensuite, nous adoptons une démarche dissuasive lorsqu'une situation devient plus compliquée et sort du cadre de la prévention par le dialogue, ou alors lorsque la menace devient plus sérieuse et nécessite une solution plus adaptée. Dans ce cas de figure, par le truchement de mes bons opus, des bons opus de mes adjoints, nous engageons d'autres acteurs qui peuvent influencer les protagonistes en sollicitant, par exemple, la communauté internationale ou en ayant recours à la diplomatie préventive. La dissuasion est également effectuée concomitamment à un déploiement visible et robuste de la force et de la police sans recours à la force à ce stade. Ainsi, durant le processus électoral, par exemple, nous avons déployé plusieurs bases opérationnelles temporaires, en plus de nos bases opérationnelles permanentes, en vue de montrer que la mission était prête à agir en cas d'escalade. Enfin, en dernier recours, la réponse effective à la menace, en cas de recrudescence de la violence, à laquelle nos troupes apportent une réponse appropriée en faisant usage de la force pour faire cesser les exactions à l'encontre des populations civiles. Il s'agit pour la MINUSCA de protéger physiquement les civils en danger, y compris les femmes et les enfants, ainsi que les minorités ethniques ou religieuses, tout comme les populations les plus vulnérables, telles que les personnes déplacées ou les réfugiés en usage de la force d'une manière raisonnable et proportionnée, tout en essayant de laisser une opportunité pour un dialogue entre les parties. La stratégie, les principes et la vision de protection des, des civils. À la lumière de notre mandat qui nous invite à prendre des mesures actives pour anticiper, dissuader et répondre efficacement aux menaces graves et crédibles qui pèsent sur la population civile, la stratégie de protection des civils adoptée par la MINUSCA se fonde sur trois objectifs qui visent à donner une vision, une approche claire sur la protection des civils, à guider les travaux des acteurs pour établir les priorités de la protection et à relever les défis immédiats et à court terme de la protection. Les principes et la vision de cette stratégie de protection sont, quant à eux, basés sur les principes génériques de la protection des civils du système de maintien de la paix des Nations Unies, qui requiert, comme vous le savez, le consentement de l'État haute, l'impartialité de la mission et le non-recours à la force sauf en cas de légitime défense ou en cas de défense du mandat qui nous est confié par le Conseil de sécurité. Les principes et la vision reposent également sur la promotion et le respect des droits de l'homme et du droit international humanitaire. L'approche de « ne faites aucun mal » de notre âme et la mise en place des mesures d'atténuation des méfaits. La tolérance zéro à l'égard de l'exploitation sexuelle des abus sexuels et enfin sur l'approche genre. La protection communautaire est également une dimension à prendre en considération, en particulier la protection des femmes et des enfants qui sont victimes de violences avant, pendant et après les élections, par exemple, et cela nous l'assurons en synergie avec les équipes d'engagement communautaire qui interagissent avec les autorités des communautés locales avec les organisations communautaires locales, avec les principaux dirigeants politiques et les dirigeants communautaires, avec l'armée et la police nationale, avec les partis en conflit, les partis au conflit, je veux dire, et la population locale, donc y compris avec les organisations de femmes également sur le, sur le terrain. Par exemple, pour ce qui est de ces élections, nous avons euh, mis en place 
une ligne qu'on appelle la 1325. Il reçoit des centaines et des centaines d'appels par jour. Et c'était une ligne dédiée aux femmes qui étaient victimes de violences, à qui on empêchait de faire campagne, qui étaient parfois violentées et kidnappées. Mais cette ligne est aujourd'hui est utilisée également par, par les hommes. Et donc, c'est une ligne qui fonctionne, 1325, qui renvoie à la révolution euh, euh, femme et sécurité 1325, et qui continue aujourd'hui à fonctionner, qui est très, 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 très solide. Ça aussi, c'est une autre dimension également de la prévention, parce que ça entre dans le cadre de, de, de la protection, ça entre dans le cadre de la, de la prévention. Au sein de la force de la MINUSCA, il existe des équipes d'engagement féminin et mixtes. Au sein des contingents, par exemple, au sein des contingents zambiens, des contingents burundais, pakistanais, comme tanzaniens, bengladais, camerounais et même rwandais. Et dont le rôle, le rôle de ces équipes d'engagement féminin et mixtes, et l'instauration d'une plus grande confiance au sein de la communauté locale, grâce à l'interaction avec la population féminine et la compréhension également de ces problèmes. Cela permet non seulement de donner aux femmes et aux enfants un plus grand sentiment de sécurité, mais aussi de partager des problèmes en plus de la collecte d'informations précieuses. Et le dernier problème que j'ai abordé rapidement, c'est les défis de la protection. Et faut-il le préciser, la MINUSCA fait face à un certain nombre de défis liés notamment à la protection des civils et surtout à la coordination ou au défaut de coordination et à la multiplicité des acteurs sur le terrain. Aujourd'hui, nous agissons, nous avons les forces armées centrafricaines, nous avons les forces de sécurité intérieure, mais également nous avons des forces bilatérales qui sont venues également à la demande du gouvernement souverain centrafricain. Nous avons des Russes qui interviennent sur le terrain, nous avons des Rwandais qui interviennent sur le terrain, et la multiplicité des acteurs dont les mandats peuvent se chevaucher ou être complètement différents peut constituer des défis pour la protection des populations. La MINUSCA n'étant pas, dans ce cas, l'épicentre de la protection. Et souvent, d'ailleurs, son mandat est mal compris, pas seulement par les populations, mais même par les autorités nationales. Et comme je l'ai évoqué au tout début. Dans la conscience populaire, parfois, les gens pensent que la MINUSCA est venue pour faire la guerre. Voilà. Parfois, on nous dit, mais non, ce sont les Russes qui combattent, c'est les Rwandais, la MINUSCA n'a fait rien. Or, la MINUSCA n'est pas une mission de guerre, c'est une mission de paix. Et c'est important de le, de le rappeler, c'est pourquoi nous mettons beaucoup d'accent sur la communication, sur l'explication de notre mandat et en utilisant les moyens de communication qui sont à notre disposition dans notre radio. Et c'est important également qu'on puisse euh, vraiment le faire comprendre. Voilà un peu, euh, cher ami, euh, cher frère Mohamed, ce que je voulais vous livrer comme contribution à euh, ce débat, à ces échanges qui me paraissent extrêmement euh, importants. Merci de m'avoir donné l'occasion euh, de prendre la parole au nom de la mission. Merci beaucoup. I thank His Excellency SRG Nkunadaya for his informative and comprehensive remarks. Really, your insights provided us with a very important field perspective on the tremendous efforts undertaken by the UN peacekeepers in a very complex and challenging environment. We, through you, Your Excellency, would like to convey to the MINUSCA, members of the mission of MINUSCA, our appreciation and our support. And quite frankly, I have been personally had the chance to visit some time ago uh, Bangui and really uh, this sisterly country and its great people deserve to live in peace, security and prosperity and our full support to your mission and to its success. So thank you very much. And let me then shift to my dear sister. My dear sister, Her Excellency Ambassador Liberata Mulamula, member of the UN Security uh, Secretary General's Peace Building Fund, the PPF. 
She is member of the sixth advisory board of the PPF. And my question to her is that in light of the recent investments in gender, youth, and community empowerment programs in mission settings to support establishing a protective environment for civilians. How can the Peace Building Fund support the programs aimed at building and strengthening national and local capacities in critical areas? Moreover, how can we ensure prioritization and sustainability of these programs in light of the funding challenges that may raise due, or actually it's not may raise, but it's certainly raised due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So my dear sister, Ms. Liberta, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, I don't know, you can hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, yes, we do, we do, we do, my dear sister. Okay, thank you, Ambassador Mohammed. I really appreciate uh, this opportunity and I wanted to start by congratulating you on your assumption of the chairmanship of the Peace Building Commission. We are confident that uh, we are in good hands, especially at this uh, critical time. I also want to thank the uh, Under Secretary General for Peace Operations. I'm happy to see you, Excellency, and uh, through you, I would like to extend my deepest condolences following the killing of the Italian ambassador as he was on a tour of duty in the Eastern DRC, the area that you mentioned. So we stand with you, we stand with the government of uh, Italy in this uh, difficult time, but also we wanted to underline the fact that this should not get us to slow down on these peace efforts in that uh, volatile region. So Excellencies, uh, just coming to the peace building fund, of, uh, of course the question has been very specific, but let me say that uh, I don't want to assume that our audience maybe are very familiar with the fund. Uh, of course, let me in short say that the UN peace, Be peace building fund is the financial instruments of the Secretary General, which is, we call it the first resort to sustaining peace in the post-conflict countries, in particular, or countries that are at the risk of affected by violent conflicts. The fund that operates across uh, pillars of the UN, it supports integrated UN responses to fill critical, critical gaps and uh, responds quickly and fle flexibility. That's why it is called the catalytic, a catalytic fund. And that's what it was meant to be. So in response to your question, Chair, let me say that uh, the peace building fund has actually fully recognized how important all these issues are with regard to supporting the programs aimed at building and strengthening national and local capacities in the critical areas. Its strategy for 2020-24 actually has three major priorities that all speak to your question. One, it supports the transitions between the UN configurations. I will explain uh, a bit in detail about this, but uh, this also goes to what um, the Under Secretary General Jean Pierre has been talking about uh, that, of course, peace, peacekeeping, peace, uh, peacekeeping, peace building, peacemaking, it's all like uh, all integrated. Two, it supports inclusive peace building by engaging women and youth, and this is critical. Three, it supports cross border approaches which is in part also about uh, reaching more local actors in very remote areas and undeserved areas. So with regard to the transitions, Chair, the peace building, as you know very well, plays an important part in facilitating transitions by starting to invest early in areas where peacekeeping is drawing down. So when the UN Security Council 
decides that now it is time for the peacekeeping forces to leave, then of course, this is where the fund becomes very critical during that transition, but towards stabilization of those countries. As I said, most of it is the post-conflict countries. But it also addresses gaps that also incentivizes a shift in the capacities of UN and other actors to step in and uh, step up. So we step in, we step up. <laughs> Important role is based on national ownership. And I underline the national ownership because Chair, in your uh, introduction, you emphasized the issue of the cent uh, people-centered approach and ownership. So this peace building fund, in fact, as it has evolved, it has focused more on national ownership, meaning to engage the local actors. For example, in Darfur, Sudan, uh, this was also a very difficult area. The peace building fund started to fund its first initiative in 2018. I don't know if anyone is uh, familiar with this Golo, J. Berimala, during that period which witnessed the fall of the previous Sudanese government and the start of the three-year national transition. In this context of these changes, the Jebo Mara region in Darfur saw increased violence. And um, yeah, of course, as was expected, and of course, the, the targeting vulnerable communities and the weakening of social cohesion, rule of law, and the protection mechanisms which resulted in increased incidence of intercommunal crashes. So the project through the Peace Building Fund helped to address these issues in Golo by strengthening local peace communities and justice institutions, but also fostering collaboration between the local government, the civil society organizations, because the United Nations Africa Union mission in Darfur, which is now being withdrawn, and the United Nations country team in Sudan. This was just one of the examples of just to address the issues of transition and how the peace building fund comes in. But with regard to investing in women and youth engagement and community empowerment, Chair, the fund really has a unique role. And this is where we find the Catholic law has come into play through its gender and youth promotion initiatives. So through the annual competitive call for proposals to support new and innovative ways of breaking down barriers faced, that face women and young people to engage in political peace building processes and to facilitate their meaningful participation in these processes at all levels, the fund has been engaging the women at the local level. They come up with uh, the priority programs rather than the peace building fund or the UN dictating what is good for them. So it's all based on their needs assessment. I was privileged to visit uh, Colombia under this uh, peace fund assessment mission. And we were, I was quite impressed to see how the women and the youth have taken this leadership to ensure that they, the peace building fund will just invest in areas where others, in fact, if you are at the UN headquarters, you can't find it's relevant. For example, if they want you to, they had asked the fund to invest in a, a social, it's like a stadium, <laughs> but where they could have all their social gatherings, their reconciliation meetings. So the UN said, okay, and this is what was one of the areas that I found was quite impressive. And they start there, of course, the kindergarten schools through their own assessment of needs and the peace building fund and puts in funds. So let me say at least 40% of all project funds have to go to local organizations. So between 2016 and 2020, the fund has invested almost 154.4 million in this uh, gender and youth peace initiative projects. But moreover, Chair, let me say, the fund is seen as a leading UN instrument, which is, is with it, I mean, it is a, to invest at least, and it has invested at least 30% of all project funds in gender sensitive peace building, which is twice the UN minimum standard of 15%, because that's what the UN requires, but then the peace, peace building fund has gone beyond that. And me as a woman peace activist, I always, uh, 
blow the trumpet on this uh, achievement that the UN has been able to, to meet the target and beyond. So this is, is one, I mean, one of the area where you have uh, wanted to know how much this fund has been invested in this in building the capacity of the local women, peace actors and the communities. Okay. And then um, let me also, before I conclude, say that one way to pro pro prioritize such programs in this COVID time, and because of cause of COVID, is not to forget to invest in peace building. The Secretary General has made a clear case why this is so important if we are to build back better. I remember, I mean, I know, you know, the replenishment conference that was held on the 26th of January, uh, which attracted a big number of, um, of member states trying to replenish this fund adequately and so to have it more predictable funding to ensure that all these projects that are for sustaining peace and prevention are really effectively implemented. So the, of course the fund has a target of 1.5 billion for 2020-2024, which the, the Secretary General of course in his ambitious uh, program calls the quantum leap. But as we are speaking and with following the replenishment conference, we have been able to raise, and I third of that, about 439 million after the replenishment, January replenishment conference. So this is a good start, I must say, in spite of COVID-19, because at least people were very skeptical that uh, with the attention now on COVID-19, you might not have countries pledging funds to this peace building fund. But we found it was beyond our expectations. But let me say but that uh, more needs to happen, to be done, especially as a new chair of the peace building fund to get the membership to step up, to step up in their contribution. Because you find the, there is only few, few donor countries that have been uh, donating in this fund throughout the year. So we need to broaden that. And finally, chair, you asked about the sustainability. This is an important issue. The fund alone cannot cover all the needs. It is a catalytic instrument and relies on many partners coming together and bidding on what is support, it is supporting in a critical moment, like transitional settings, which I mentioned at country level. What we need is a much broader partnership for peace to achieve this, moving beyond just the traditional donors in this space. Uh, of course, the special, uh, special representative uh, Central African Republic has mentioned the need for coordination, the need for collaboration, the need for engaging the multi stakeholders. And this is also what the Peace Building Fund is focusing on. So you find that it was because the Pledging Fund Conference was an important signal that several Peace Building Fund recipient countries also pledged for the first time to contribute to the fund. And this includes countries like Sierra Leone, Chair the Gambia and Burkina Faso pledging some good money to be able to show their goodwill, but also to recognize the importance of this peace building fund. So this signals solidarity and commitments to multilateral partnerships, but it will be a good start if more member states, including those that can afford to give much more, followed the example of even this uh, uh, post-conflict countries. Uh, Chair, let me end here and uh, I'll be more than happy to respond to any questions or to hear the comments from the audiences. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, my dear sister, Ambassador Liberata Nambula. And thank you for your insightful reflections. Really, the role of the Peace Building Fund remains indispensable in providing catalytic and risk tolerant support to countries affected by conflict, especially amid the ongoing pandemic. And uh, indeed, the PPF is looked at as the fuel in the car to move forward, to move and to move forward. And thank you for assuring us that the car would be fueled in order to reach its destination. And uh, let me also, my dear sister, join you in addressing uh, 
our deep sympathy and condolences to the Italian government and to the UN in the passing away of late the Excellency Ambassador Luca Atanasio, Italy. This bright ambassador, bright diplomat, lost his life in uh, the attack against the UN convoy in DRC. And this really highlights the risk uh, and the high price uh, UN personnel has to pay for discharging this mission of keeping peace and uh, really uh, our uh, appreciation and our sympathy and our support goes to all UN missions who are really sacrificing their life at hard times and difficult circumstances. Uh, let me now, uh, and of course, make the sister looking forward to our future cooperation, of course, the, the, uh, the link between the Peace Building Commission and Peace Building Fund is organic. And uh, the bond is closed, and we're looking forward to cooperating together in uh, enhancing the work of the uh, PBC through also uh, enhancing the status of the PBF. Now, I have the pleasure to uh, take uh, an intervention from the floor. We have Mr. Mike Zakoma, Senior Civil Affairs, UN Mission in South Sudan, on MIS, to brief us on the COVID-19 prevention initiative with ITPs leading to the innovative award. My dear brother, you have the floor to brief us on that initiative. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Your Excellencies, colleagues, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mike Jakuma. Can you hear me, please? Hey. Okay. Yes, we do, my dear brother. We do hear you well. Thank you. All Thank right. you so much. Uh, my name is Mr. Mike Jakuma. As you rightly said, I'm a senior civil affairs officer and deputy chief of civil affairs with a mission in South Sudan on MIS. Before I start my presentation, I also want to express my condolences to the government of Italy in the recent unfortunate incident in the DR Congo. But it just shows the dangers and risks that all peacekeepers face globally. Now, as you said in your introduction, I'm supposed to make a presentation on our operations in support of COVID-19 in South Sudan, which has led to a nomination of one of our activities for the SG's Award for Innovation. Before then, I want to touch briefly on, a, on the POC mandate of the mission. Ambassador Lecroix had mentioned a lot of things that we do, and these are global, they cut across all missions. But I'll add that the POC mandate of ONMIS is unique in the sense that we have a number of settlements, which we call POC sites, adjacent to our camps, which hosts IDPs. So we protect these IDPs in an enclosed area adjacent to our respective camps. This has been ongoing since 2013. However, we are in the process of reclassifying these camps and we're going to call them IDP settlements. This is a legal process whereby our responsibility to these IDPs would slightly change in the sense that government will have a joint responsibility towards protecting them. <clears throat> This does not, however, derogate or deviate from our protection mandate as a mission as a whole. So far, a number of these camps have been reclassified and we have seen some cooperation with government in protecting civilians in these camps. Two are still outstanding. One is in Malakal, Upper Nile, and the other is in a place called Bentu in Unity State. 
over the course of time, the bulk of our resources have been devoted to protecting civilians in these POC sites, particularly the police services. And so the reclassification will free up resources to enable us to implement the mandate more effectively across the country. Now, our POC mandate, as Mr. Lecroy indicated, is implemented in tandem or in collaboration with partners, including the UN country team and humanitarians who also comprise NGOs. On the part of the mission, our POC mandate is mostly mainstreamed. And this means that every mission component has a role to play in the protection of civilians. In fact, the POC section of the mission is a very small unit, which is hosted by the Office of the Head of Mission. We have a few field officers who are POC advisors dotted across the country. And so POC is the duty of every staff member, not necessarily any particular section or component. Civil Affairs Division, being one of the biggest in the mission, has a very important role to play in this regard. Mr. Lecroy mentioned a couple of things we do. Early warning, information gathering, prevention, mitigation, and resolution of conflicts. So these are the things that we do as a section generally. Now, the Civil Affairs section is unique in the sense that it comprises staff members of various and diverse backgrounds. I'm a lawyer by training from Ghana. I have colleagues who are nutritionists, some are journalists, some are conflict resolution experts. Just to let you know that our background it is very diverse and this makes civil affairs very unique. Now, coming to the COVID-19 and our interventions, over the period, we have implemented approximately 100 activities across the country in pursuit of addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. Some of these include advocacy, campaigns, distribution of leaflets on educating the community on the pandemic, distribution of face masks, sanitizers, and what have you. But one particular initiative stands out, which I want to speak to now. I was deployed in Malakal, Upper Nile State, as a team leader until recently. So I speak with first-hand knowledge of this particular activity. When, a, when the, the pandemic broke, we got our first case in South Sudan towards the end of March, 2020. Naturally, we were not prepared. And so we we're all desperate as to how to find solutions to the problem. There were no sufficient masks to go around, no sanitizers, but there was nothing, given that this is already a war-torn and poor country. It was in the midst of this that a colleague who, in addition to her expertise as a gender person, also happens to be a fashion designer as a hobby. She tried her hands on making a couple of face masks using local material and fabric acquired on the market. She shared it with uh, the mission's local doctor and the WHO representative. And they certified it to be fit for purpose and could be used by the community. So this was a, a discovery. And so as the section, we set to look for funding to produce the masks in large quantities. 
as a first step, we got staff members to make voluntary contributions, cash donations towards the project. The response was enthusiastic and we raised quite a huge number of, a huge sum of money. And so we set out to look for tailors. This particular staff member identified dressmakers and tailors from the IDP community and the local population and trained them in the mask making process. That was how the project started. We now got UNHCR to make cash donations also and WFP to give us food for the participants in the project, which was called Food for Labor. Overall, we had produced and distributed 52,000 face masks, 52,000 face masks across all of Upper Nile. Beneficiaries included staff of the UN and our partners, local population, IDPs, the military, the police, and persons working along the border with Sudan. This very humble initiative has gone viral and we received the nomination of the Secretary General for Innovation. It does not matter whether or not we win the award, but the bottom line is that in the midst of crisis, we're able to be creative enough to make a difference in the lives of our communities. Now to conclude, let me just state clear, briefly the benefits of this project overall. As we trained the tailors, the project concluded, but they have acquired a new skill set that will assist them to start means of livelihood, even outside of the POC community. We also enhance their skills overall in management, record keeping, and general business practices. Of course, the primary, in it, the primary objective was to assist in the COVID prevention efforts. And I believe at the peak of the crisis, these masks may have saved a couple of lives. The project also engenders peaceful coexistence among the communities because we brought various ethnic groups together to make this face mask. It also enhanced partnerships between the UN and its local partners, be the government, local population, and among the UN country team itself, and improved relations between all of us. And most importantly, it unearthed talents because this colleague who happened to be a fashion designer has actually charted a new course for civil affairs in Upper Nile. And I want to commend the civil affairs structure overall. As I said, I'm a lawyer by training and my first job in the UN was a, as a rule of law officer. Rule of law is very strict, but civil affairs allows us to be creative and to think outside the box. I believe in the event of another crisis, we're going to have other people come up with more creative and innovative ideas to solve problems as and when they arise. I want to stop here and thank you so much for the opportunity. Now answer questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, my dear brother, Mr. Mike, for briefing us on this important field project. And which show, showcase really the great contribution of peacekeeping missions amid the pandemic and how missions have adapted and innovated to continue to deliver on their mandates and protecting the people. And indeed, innovation always offers a way forward 
and a new horizon. Well, now uh, we move to the concluding segment of our session, and I will really invite our uh, distinguished panelists to briefly uh, make concluding remarks, uh, responding to the following question. Building on different insights we hear today in concrete recommendations, how do we see or how do you see the world the way forward? Across the peace operation life cycle, what kind of support is needed from the UN headquarters, mission leadership, the peace building architecture, and the AU to recalibrate their protection related task, tasks towards empowering and engaging local communities with the view of strengthening their contributions to sustaining peace and development. And uh, I go back to our distinguished panelists and I give the floor to USG Jean-Pierre Lacroix. Thank you very much, uh, dear Mohamed, and, uh, and, and, and many thanks to uh, uh, the previous speakers. I listened to their statement with uh, 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 great interest and a, a lot of attention, and there were so many relevant points. So I will just uh, limit myself to uh, uh, the, a few points very quickly. One is that uh, it is important to uh, never lose sight of uh, the primacy of politics. Uh, protection of civilians is a, a very important part of our mandate, uh, but it should never be uh, seen as uh, detached from uh, the overall political objectives of peacekeeping and indeed of uh, uh, you know what we do uh, collectively as uh, um, you know actors in uh, promoting peace in, uh, in in a given country in a given region. And I believe that it, it is important because if you um, think of a, of, of a peacekeeping mission, if you think of a protection of mandate, uh, of a uh, protection of civilian mandate uh, as a standalone, uh, you know, we are um, not likely to, to achieve uh, uh, our uh, primary objective, which is to find or to help find a durable solution to crisis. So that's my message number one. Uh, POC is uh, extremely important, but uh, POC uh, should never be a standalone uh, uh, part of a mandate. It has to be uh, linked and, and associated with uh, uh, sustained efforts at promoting a political and durable solution. Uh, indeed, I would uh, add that the ultimate protection of civilian is uh, the finding the, the achievement of a durable uh, peace, uh, a durable political solution. So that's number one. Number two, and this has been highlighted by many of the speakers previously, uh, protection of civilian uh, is a partnership. And I think, uh, Moving forward, we should really uh, put a strong focus on these uh, the, the, the partnership nature of, uh, of protection of civilian. Make sure that uh, uh, we we do uh, work, uh, you know, within uh, a, a global strategy with our partner on protection of civilian. That you know we associate as much as possible not only the uh, other partners uh, um, you know, within the UN system, the partners of peacekeeping, such as the agency funds and program, but NGOs and, and regional, sub-regional organization, and, and of course, uh, uh, the uh, other um, entities, international entities, so, such as the World Bank. I, I believe we really need to, to, to view uh, POC as an integrated uh, partnership. And I, so, I also believe that we, we need to uh, see POC as uh, an undertaking that has to be sustained over time. That is to say, uh, even beyond uh, the, uh, the, 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 the lifespan of a peacekeeping mission. And therefore, uh, it is also important to uh, project uh, the sustainability and prepare the sustainability of uh, POC efforts uh, 
throughout and beyond uh, the life, the existence of peacekeeping mission. And here, uh, a key aspect is um, the support to uh, national state capacities, because ultimately, a peacekeeping mission uh, is in a better position to gradually draw down and exit when uh, it has contributed to build a resilient, credible, and solid uh, national state institution and regional local state institution, particularly security and forces, uh, uh, but also um, the judiciary, the police, the correction, and uh, those key state institutions that can eventually prepare the ground for the, um, the, 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 the return or, or the, the, the rollout of uh, uh, other uh, critical uh, services such as health and education. So that's uh, number two. And number three, uh, funding. And this has been um, alluded to by a number of speakers. I think it's very important to uh, continue and, and in, indeed, I mean, and step up our efforts to make sure that uh, the protection of civilian activities uh, will uh, be given the necessary fund to operate both uh, in the peacekeeping budget, but also uh, you know, I'm speaking as um, to you as a, a as a chair of a, a peace building a commission, uh, the the peace building fund and um, and and other source of funding. You know, or many of our peacekeeping mission have uh, uh, trust funds uh, with um, basically based on on on, the, on 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 voluntary contribution to 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 also support. Uh, uh, the kind of peace building project and activities that are essential to our work. So um, I would really end by, uh, you know, with this plea that uh, we need to continue our efforts to make sure that uh, those uh, very important uh, POC activities, those projects that are uh, essential uh, to the overall uh, delivery of our POC mandate, uh, they, they should be uh, funded, uh, they should have uh, adequate and sufficient uh, uh, financial resources. And I will stop here. Many, many thanks for uh, all this. This was a, a very interesting and enlightening uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. USG Jean-Pierre Lacroix, highly appreciated indeed. Thank you very much. And I'll give the floor to SRCG Mikurn Daya. Maybe uh, unmute, please, uh, SRCG Nidaya. Yes. Merci beaucoup. Vous m'entendez? Yes, please. Yes. Go ahead. Merci, merci beaucoup, cher, cher frère Mohamed. Donc, rapidement sur, sur trois points. Euh, les défis, je pense que les défis sont importants et Jean-Pierre Lacroix vient de souligner un défi important, c'est la question des ressources. Et parfois, on constate l'inadéquation, l'inadéquation des ressources affectées au mandat de la mission dans le cadre de l'exercice de, de son mandat de, de protection. Ça, c'est un défi important aussi qui se pose de plus en plus avec la raréfaction des ressources et la diminution également des ressources, euh, des budgets qui sont affectés aux opérations de maintien de la paix. Il y a d'autres défis liés à l'incapacité de l'État aussi à contrôler son territoire. Euh, nous sommes en Centrafrique où une partie du territoire aussi n'est pas sous contrôle de, de l'État, où il n'y a pas de présence du tout, euh, d'aucun signe de l'État, euh, ni force de défense, ni force de sécurité, ni service administratif. Et ça aussi c'est un problème. Euh, et, et, et également, il y a la question également des relations avec les autorités nationales ou les autorités locales qui ne sont pas toujours euh, faciles. Et parfois aussi, dans certains sites de personnes déplacées, et nous voyons qu'il y a des éléments militaires qui se trouvent et ça pose la question de la neutralité également des sites de personnes déplacées où il ne doit pas euh, euh, être euh, des, 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 des forces armées et c'est le cas aujourd'hui en Centrafrique dans certaines régions du, euh, du pays. Alors, l'autre problème, c'est le problème de la coordination. Je l'ai souligné tout à l'heure, euh, nous sommes sur un terrain où il y a d'autres forces militaires en présence. Euh, qui sont venus euh, répondre à l'appel euh, du gouvernement euh, souverain centrafricain. Euh, nous n'avons pas les mêmes règles d'engagement. Ces forces sont venues pour servir d'appoint aux forces armées centrafricaines et aux forces de sécurité intérieure pour faire la guerre sur le terrain. On n'a pas les mêmes règles d'engagement et cela pose de très sérieux problèmes de coordination aussi, de protection des populations civiles aussi, euh, parce que ces forces ne sont pas toujours tenues par euh, le respect des règles 
d'engagement des, des Nations Unies. Ça, c'est un problème aussi qui se pose, qu'il faut absolument euh, résoudre. Nous avons fait des propositions pour coordonner davantage nos actions avec ces forces bilatérales. Quelques efforts ont été faits, mais il reste beaucoup à faire sur le terrain. Le troisième et dernier problème, c'est un peu les relations avec euh, les populations. Il est, il, est, il est établi que dans les régions où les contingents euh, ont établi de bonnes relations avec les communautés locales et où la confiance est instaurée entre les contingents et la communauté euh, locale, la protection a été plus efficace. Euh, si la coopération civile et militaire est certainement le moyen d'aborder la protection comme une responsabilité partagée, les réseaux d'alerte communautaire et les assistants de liaison communautaire aussi que nous avons ici sont des atouts précieux pour la mission. Et, et ils permettent de renforcer la capacité de protection de la mission en facilitant l'interaction et en renforçant la confiance avec les communautés locales, en établissant et en surveillant la mise en œuvre des plans de protection au niveau local, en mettant en place des systèmes d'alerte précoces et des réseaux d'alerte également communautaires, en jouant un rôle très important dans l'élaboration de nouvelles réponses urgentes, comme par rapport à la récente la pandémie euh, COVID-19, en menant simultanément également des activités de stabilisation liées, liées au rétablissement de l'autorité de, de l'État, à la résolution des conflits, à la cohabitation pacifique entre communautés et à la cohésion euh, sociale. Donc voilà quelques leçons que nous tirons de l'exercice de notre mandat de précaution euh, des populations civiles, euh, qui est vraiment euh, l'essence même euh, du, du mandat des opérations de maintien de la paix, parce que c'est autour de ce mandat de protection des populations civiles que tournent tous les autres aspects du mandat de, 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 de l'opération de maintien de la paix. Merci beaucoup, Pierre Mahmoud. Thank you so much, SRSG, Mkir Nidaya. Highly appreciated indeed. Now I give the floor to Ambassador Liberata Mula Mula. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm told we don't have much time as there's another session. Uh, so in short, I, I agree with what the previous speakers have said in summation. But what I want to underline here is that uh, we should put our mouth, well, I mean, we should put the money where our mouth is <laughs> in all these processes. But also one issue which I didn't want to, I, I thought um, um, this USG would be here, the issue of sexual gender-based violence needed to be really ad addressed because even the time of COVID, it has intensified because in uh, conflict areas, it's even worse. So I wanted to underline that, that this should come up also because it is zero tolerance, but there's zero attention. It's continuing <laughs> abatedly. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, my dear sister, Pastor Liberata Mula Mula, highly appreciated indeed. I think now we have uh, reached the end of this session and quite frankly, for the sixth time, I think no need to go into any uh, extensive uh, wrap up of the session. You have heard it directly from our distinguished uh, panelists and you have heard that the uh, integrated whole of, of mission approach to the implementation of POC mandate has been already highlighted and the POC requires a collective effort of different peacekeeping missions, components, civilian, police, and military personnel, that the POC is not uh, limited to physical protection and it's not a standalone endeavor. It's part of the all over political objective of the mission. And it is it goes during and beyond the life cycle and that empowering people and fostering community resilience is central and uh, objective of peacekeeping operations that is imperative to enhance the contribution of peacekeeping operations to peace building and sustaining peace. And of course, the, this includes also more investment in capacity building of the host country to enable them to fulfill the, their primary responsibility in protecting their people and the role of PBF is crucial, appreciated, and needs to be supported and enhanced the COVID-19 pandemic has amplified the vulnerabilities of civilians and therefore it's important more than ever to concretize efforts to enable peacekeeping operations for deliver, for, for, from delivering on their 
POC mandates while mitigating the impact of the pandemic, and finally, building partnerships, advancing coherence, and enhancing coordination among different stakeholders are key to the effective delivery on POC mandates, including through leveraging complementarities and comparative advantages. I think here only to thank all our distinguished panelists and all participants in this session, and to thank the As One Forum for sustainable peace and development, and to have a wish that hopefully in the next edition of this forum, we meet all together in Aswan. So be well, stay safe, and thank you very much. Thank you. This is adjourned. Thank you. thank you. We also had innovative approaches. Approaches on your point. Indeed, hard with operators, and we thank our dear brother Mike for giving yes. example of the innovation yeah. and innovative approaches, which is really crucial for having yeah. new ways forward. Thank, thank you very you. much. I thank you, Ambassador. See you soon. And this session is adjourned. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Merci beaucoup.